Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to talk to you about every single thought I had while reading Mr. Impossible by Magistee Farta. So this is not a review, it's literally just me going in chronological order from starting the book to finishing the book with every single thought I had while I was reading. I wrote them all down. Without further ado, let's get right into it. I do have to say though, if you haven't read this book, don't watch this video because this video contains... Spoilers. <laughs> First thought was a continuation from Call Down the Hawk because in Call Down the Hawk I really hated Bride as a character and Bride was not even present yet. And then we meet Bride and I also don't like him in this book. I thought that he was just so arrogant and I hate teachers like him who are ones who think there's only a certain way of doing things, ones who want them to subscribe to your idea rather than letting you open answer things and you know answer outside of the box sometimes. I hate that he emotionally manipulates them. I felt like it was very easy to see that he was emotionally manipulating Hennessy and Ronan and I also didn't like the way that he called them his dreamers as if it was like possessive and ownership I didn't like any of that and I was sincerely hoping from the beginning of this book that Bride would turn out to be a villain as the book went on you could definitely see that he was trying to cut them off from their friends and family and just you know only depend on him and I was like this these are just red flags after red flags I also realized that I liked Hennessy a lot more I could see that her character had changed distinctly and she was not the person that we'd known before I think one of the easiest ways to see that was because she has a kind of curse word that is her curse word in the first book and it starts with a B and it's one of my curse words that I really don't like and she uses it quite a lot casually so that helped me not like her character in the first book. I didn't really like her in the first book but she's also less, I don't know, she was mean before and she's still mean now but there's something about the way that her character's slowly been adjusted that that meanness has definitely been turned more inwards and you can see that she's struggling a, mo a lot emotionally which you can see in the first book but in a different light. You see it in a different light here and she has her monologues and we know that she cares about Ronan as a friend so I definitely liked her a lot more in this book than the other book and that struck me right at the beginning as well. One of my comments here is Ronan is so Ronan lol which I think summarizes this whole book very well. So I really liked how Ronan and Hennessy both were constantly casually thinking about Jordan and Adam. You can see that Jordan is a very significant person in Hennessy's life and that Adam is a very significant person in Ronan's life but the way that they just casually are always thinking about them casually always have them at the back of their mind even when they're apart and I really like seeing that. I also wrote down that I really liked how the writing seemed back on track in this book. In Cool Down the Hawk there was something about the writing style that seemed overdone, that seemed a bit too much like Steve Farta trying too hard at her own style of writing but in this it all felt natural again, it felt wholesome. I really liked how she again went back to capturing a single snapshot of a moment and describing it perfectly and just having that still there in your mind which shows something about a certain character or a certain moment. I really like that. I also thought her writing was just magical and lyrical and beautiful and fantastical but not overdone like it seemed to be in the first one. I didn't like that the car that Ronan makes was called the burrito. I had an interesting discussion with Jade because she says that Ronan just names everything and Ronan was the one who named the pig in the first book so it makes sense that everything has a name like that. He names all the things that he creates but I was like personally immediately I was like I don't like that the car is called the burrito and it's this significant car because it feels too much like a pig ripoff the Kamara ripoff and I don't like when sequel series have those kind of similarities to the original where it's not done in a way that feels unique but it feels like a copy I'm very fussy with my sequel series like that so I was not pleased with that moment or pleased with that car but at the same time Fair enough. I liked Ronan and Hennessy's relationship. I liked seeing their friendship in this one. I liked seeing the way that they communicate. It was just so utterly them because they're both so similar to each other whilst distinctly still being different enough to be their own individual characters. And I think it makes their interactions all the more interesting for it. And I also loved the introduction of Sweet Meals. What a great addition to the series. It just was a huge game changer to include them. And I was absolutely blown away by the concept of the Sweet Meals. And it was also painful to discover the Sweet Meals because I couldn't help thinking, oh my goodness, what if Ronan had known that the Sweet Meals existed in the Raven Cycle? It would have saved Aurora's life and would have changed his whole, his whole life if his mother was still alive. And I couldn't help thinking about that and just thinking about what Ronan's reaction might be when 
when he discovers sweet meals, which he didn't in this book. For some reason they didn't tell him, but I wish they did. But I think that's a thought that I had later on. So let's get back to chronological order. I was feeling emotional about Matthew's character in here and how he's just having this huge identity crisis because he's discovered that he's a dream. And I was just like, oh, Matthew. Matthew is a cinnamon roll character. So I was just feeling, you know, protective mother-like feels towards Matthew. I was also laughing at the fact that Declan is definitely living the hard parenting life because Matthew is directing all of these like feelings of betrayal and being lied to towards Declan and Declan's like raising this teenager while he's just a young adult himself and I was just finding that dynamic while they're at the barns so funny and a postcard arrives from Jordan and Declan is crushing so hard he is so whipped and I enjoyed seeing that. I also really liked the environmentally friendly focused storyline. I liked that it was all about, you know, freeing up the ley lines by destroying all these man-made things around it. I was like, wow, I love seeing an environmentally friendly storyline just casually woven in. I mean, it turns into something different, but I like the idea. I noted that I felt absolutely nothing towards Farouk Lane. I've said before in my wrap up that Farouk Lane feels like a blank page. That's literally what it says here in my notes. I have no emotions whatsoever towards that character. She does not intrigue me and it's just disappointing that she doesn't intrigue me so much. And there were scenes where you actually got to see Rodan and Hennessy inside their dreams and I loved those scenes. It looked so magical and felt so wonderful. I know that dreaming has the other side to it. It can be a nightmare as well, but it was nice to see some of the joys of dreaming some of the beauty in dreaming. At this point we get to see that Ronan is resisting Bride's wants because Bride really wants them to not draw a line between reality and dreaming but Ronan's resisting that and fighting against it and I really really liked seeing Ronan fight against it I because I don't like Bride. Anything that was fighting against Bride really made me satisfied and made me feel very happy to see. But I also just liked how Ronan's nightmares were around the fact that he couldn't tell the difference and I think that's very scary. Another one of my thoughts while reading this book is what happened to Orphan Girl? What happened to Opal? I was wondering where she is, where she's at, because I know she's briefly mentioned in Call Down the Hawk and I asked Anne from Anne's Bookish Corner about it and she answered my question, but I kind of feel like she should have been included a lot more in this book. So I was a bit disappointed in that. Declan has a moment where he imagines what his life would have been like without Matthew and as soon as he has that thought for like two split seconds he feels guilty and he feels sad about it and he just hates himself for having that thought and it echoes Adam in the Raven Cycle series when he has a thought for two seconds when he first comes across Orphan Girl like oh I wish that this dream was dead because then it's easy to bury and get rid of and then he feels so horrible at about having that thought and I couldn't help seeing the Declan and Adam comparisons in that moment which I love Declan a lot so the fact that I had that comparison I was like mm -hmm, I see why I love them both. Well Rhiannon was very short-lived and my thoughts around this whole Rhiannon scene were that I was quite disappointed with how it happened because I hate when characters are introduced only for them to be killed off immediately because it's just it's an author wanting to show that there are high stakes by killing off a character but it does the reverse of that. It shows that the stakes are very low because they had to introduce a character that no one cared about and no one has any feelings for to kill them off. So it doesn't actually raise the stakes but it's used for the intention of raising the stakes so it always falls flat for me and I don't like when authors do that. So I was a bit disappointed in Rhiannon's character just being there for one second and then being dead. Then I got excited in my notes. I say like, Adam, hi, nice to see you. And it's immediately followed up with the crying emoji because of the fact that Adam is gone very quickly. We get like, two lines or two pages and I think I counted the total pages that feature Adam in presence like his actual presence in this book and it's 10 pages and if I had to give any critique from a personal level on this series it's that it doesn't have enough Adam Parrish I'm biased Adam Parrish is my favorite character from the Raven Cycle but the way that Cool Down the Hawk happened I was like we don't have enough Adam Parrish and I fully expected there to be more because of the fact that he is absent at the end of the novel and I had all these theories about him being kidnapped and everything but yeah, it was just a bit disappointing to know he was still there and he was fine. And I don't know. I was disappointed with the lack of Adam. I don't think he needs to be a main character. I don't think he needs to have a point of view. I don't think that would suit the story. But I do think I expected Ronan's storyline to run a bit closer to, to his because they are dating. So I was, I'm just disappointed by the lack of Adam. I expected from Cool Down the Hawk like, oh, we got so little Adam, we're going to get more. No, we got less. And I hope this trend doesn't continue because then it means by the third and final book we'll have like five pages of Adam and that's going to be the last one in this universe apparently. 
thank goodness for fanfic. Then I had a lot of theories. My first theory was that Bride better not be Niall, like, remade and re in existence because I think Bride told a story to Ronan and that story had a message to it and I remembered how Niall used to do the same thing for Ronan and Matthew and Declan so I was like he better not be that person and that was my first theory which I quickly disregarded but I'm telling you every thought I had so we gotta tell it. Also I noticed that Maggie Stiefvater ditched the whole thing about Declan eating anti-acids. It was a big thing in the first book, like Declan was constantly eating these anti-acid pills, but now in this book he doesn't eat them at all, there's no mention of them whatsoever, so that's another thing that she's like, we're gonna ditch this. I find it so interesting to see what authors include in the first books and then ditch by the later books. When I was reading Percy Jackson series backwards there were a lot of things that Rick Riordan included in the first book and then chose to ditch the further into the series he got, which, you know, it happens here too. I noticed that I didn't feel anything towards Liliana as a character whatsoever either, and I feel like that's the narrator's fault and Farouk Lane's fault because Liliana is a very interesting character and she has a lot of potential, but we don't hear from her point of view, we only see her through Farouk Lane's eyes and Farouk Lane as is, as I said, a blank page, so therefore I couldn't get much of a grasp of Liliana. When Ronan thinks about the people that he loves, and he's reminiscing the people that he loves, he thinks about his brothers and Adam, and that's it, full stop. He doesn't think about Gansey, he doesn't think about Blue. I don't expect him to think about Henry, but Gansey and Blue, like, he doesn't think about them at all. And I know that this is the sequel series. I know that this is separate from the Raven Cycle, and she's trying to keep Raven Cycle elements, you know, out of it, and characters out of it, because this is a whole different story. But I do think, like, we should have had one more cameo, like he has one phone call with Gansey and Blue and the rest of them in the first book. That doesn't happen here at all, and he doesn't think about them at all, and I don't think it was realistic for Ronan's character for them to be so gone out of his life because they're not present, if that makes any sense. Like, Adam is not present in his life in this book, and yet he still thinks about them a lot, and I think Gansey and Blue, as his best friends, would also be the same situation. I feel like it slightly discredits the strength of the found family in the first series and I don't like that. I don't like when follow-up things discredit, which seems contradictory to what I was just saying about how sequel series needs to be their own thing, but if you get me and the balance that needs to be in between, you get me. Then I was fangirling about Declan and Jordan. They're num one of my number one ships now. I absolutely loved all of their interactions. I loved seeing how they were having these intelligent conversations and alluding to things while not outrightly stating them. I thought everything, every moment between them was just so adorable, so cute, shipped it so much. Also love the kind of couple where one of them is like stoic and emotionally not emotionally visible so they don't really show their emotions on their face but then their partner or their romantic half can just see right through them and tell what emotions that they have. I love romantic relationships like that and this is that, like Declan and Jordan are that. At one point Ronan tries to be nice to Hennessy and it comes out all wrong and it's just him being mean to her and that was very authentic to Ronan's character so I appreciated seeing it. I also liked how Jordan's natural reaction was not let's steal a sweet meal, it's like let's make my own one. <laughs> I don't know, that girl has ambition and I'm here for it. Oh and then it flashes back to a moment where Ronan lies to Adam and I hated those lines. I hated it. I hated the idea that Ad that Ronan can lie and will lie, but more than that, I hated the fact that he lied to Adam and he lied to Adam about his mother, which is like double layers because A, it's to Adam and B, it's about his mother, which is just something I feel like he never would have lied about because he loves Aurora so much. His mother is definitely a significant figure in his life, seeing as she gave the title of this book. So I know that it was a signal, talking to Jade, we discussed that it was like a signal of the fact that, you know, the bride plot twist is what the bride, bride plot twist is, and the fact that Ronan has been lying to himself the whole time about bride is signaled by the fact that he starts even lying to people like Adam. I get that. I see that. I think it could have been just as effective without him lying to Adam. That's my two cents on that. I was then fangirling about Jordan and Matthew interactions because you know Jordan's like Matthew's coach about how to be a dream and it's adorable and just what Matthew needs but also I really like it when you have a romantic couple and the romantic the half that's not part of a family has to interact with the family and they just fit right in with the family too and that's Declan and Jordan and Matthew. Matthew's like their child because Declan's like a surrogate parent so it's just, it's just so cute. 
It's all so cute. Like, I know Matthew's not part of the ship, but the Declan, Jordan, Matthew dynamic stole the show for me. And I think at this point it was really stealing the show. And I just wanted all the scenes of that and none of the scenes of the actual plot. We also then get to see what Ronan's best dream is, his favourite dream that he's ever had. And his favourite dream was just such a beautiful dream that I was like, that is lovely. And, you know, the author didn't need to include that, but she did. And I appreciate scenes where it's like, this doesn't move the plot forward, but it shows us something intrinsic about the character that you wouldn't know unless you were in their head getting this extra scene that maybe you could cut and I think it was just a beautiful dream, a beautiful moment. Then I had a new theory that Bride was like Artemis from the original series where Artemis is like I'm part of these tree people because Bride was talking about this tree that he was literally obsessed with that has a name that I forgot what it's called and he was like I love this tree, I appreciate this tree and I was like did you live in this tree, are you this tree but you're outside of it so I thought for a second that he could have been the type of species that Blue's dad was, that was my second theory. Then the Farouk Lane Liliana romance came out of nowhere. I did not expect that romance, I could not have predicted that romance and I also, you know, it came out of nowhere and I was like, that's a romance and then I was like mm, I still can't care less because I don't know enough about these characters to care about these characters and it feels insta lovey but whatever I don't care. Then we have Jordan and Declan on a boat and it was so cute because it was just such a Declan date like the boat was a cover for something more important going on underneath and Jordan was disappointed because he's like this is so boring Declan, not like the Declan I know which is beyond the boring Declan, all of this exciting Declan, but then it did turn out to be that way and it was cute and it was really cute. <laughs> Directly after that Declan mentions that he feels happy and then he's worried because he feels happy, he's like I'm so happy something's going to go wrong. And when characters are so happy that they believe something has to go wrong it just it hurts my heart. I feel like Adam is also like that. Like if he's very happy, he's like, something is gonna mess this up because it's not right that I feel this happy. And <laughs> characters that are that way get me. I don't know why I found it so romantic, but when Declan's like seeing Jordan as his equal and not as someone to look after, I was like, oh, that's so romantic. And I know seeing someone as your equal is like a given right to a romantic situation but I feel like Declan always erds so much on the side of anyone he knows he feels responsible for, he needs to look after them but the fact that he can admire that Jordan can hold her own and doesn't need his protection or care this is just, you know, what did I call this video? Every thought I had about Mr. Impossible? It should be called Olivia Savannah Fangirls over the Jordan Declan ship. <laughs> That's what it should really be called. Declan makes a phone call to Rodan and he's making some demands and testing their brotherhood feels and we love complex family dynamics. So I was here for that. Then it was gradually revealed that Bride is kind of a villain. I feel like it's not like entirely a villain because Rodan made him, but he was, he's kind of being portrayed as a villain. And I was like, hallelujah. Finally, he's evil because I hated him from the start, so I was like glad, so happy that he wasn't a character that I was meant to like. <laughs> then we switched to Adam swooping in and explaining everything and explaining the whole situation and why Bride is bad. And he just comes in and he's very smart, he's pieced things together in his own time and he explains it all to us. And I was like, oh, here's Adam swooping in and being the intelligent one, as usual, as he is in the Raven Cycle. But in this case, that's all he's here for. Sad sadness. Then he goes again. Then he goes. <sighs> Ronan trying to exclude Adam from his life to protect him. <sighs> I'm just, it's not one of my favourite kind of storylines so I was very disappointed in Ronan in that moment. There was one line from Matthew which was that, it's a quote, it says, he used to imagine the air was a hug that was always happening and I feel like if anything describes Matthew Lynch, that describes Matthew Lynch, the kind of person that tries to imagine that the air is a constant hug. That line, perfection. I then took the time to admire the fact that Maggie Stiefvater tries to write sweet meals. She takes a concept that is so complex, that is so hard to put into words, the feeling that is put into sweet meals, the feeling that is put into creation of something beautiful but something personal but something beyond and it's so hard to capture that feeling that's unnamed, that doesn't have a word at least in the English language and she tries to write it in this book and I just admire authors who tackle or take on such a big doing in a single story when it's not even the main part of the plot and I loved how she pulled it off, I think she pulled it off well and it's a feeling that I love seeing in my own writing or just seeing or you know receiving from other people's creations, creative creations, so it was just lovely to see that. 
And then the next thought I had was about how Mr. Impossible is just so good that I can't help but down my rating from Call Down the Hawk from four stars to three stars. And I think it's kind of ironic that her second book was just so great that it made me realise how rubbish the first one was. Not rubbish, but how mediocre the first one was because I rated Call Down the Hawk four stars instead of five stars because there are lots of elements to it that disappointed me. I noticed that thing about the writing style not being that great in the first book. I noticed that the first book felt like a prologue rather than its own thing, but also if felt like a prologue to an extent that I was really disappointed. I know that Steve Farta really connects all of her storylines, you see that in the Raven Cycle, but I feel like Call Down the Hawk could not stand on its own at all and I was just disappointed in so many elements. I didn't like Hennessy, I didn't like Farouk Lane, I didn't like lots of the characters that she introduced. So I knew all of those things when I rated it four stars, but thinking about it in more detail made me realise that my rating didn't match up to my thoughts and opinions. And I noticed that while reading this book which is just one of my thoughts, so I had to say it in the video. There was a line that said Hennessy's first forgery was herself, and I was like, Hennessy's first forgery was herself. Like the line with Matthew and the hugs, it was just such a perfect capturing of the character in a single line that I had to applaud that line and just find it perfect. I also just, in my notes, I wrote, move over Ronan's nightmares. We've got Hennessy's lace because in the first series, Ronan's nightmares are just the worst thing ever. They're the stuff of true nightmares. No nightmare is worse than Ronan's nightmares. And then we get to this book and it's like, move over. Hennessy's lace, that is the true nightmare. Other people experience it, they can't stand it. So it's just like, that is truly as bad as it gets. I was also thinking about the Lynch brothers like in a line and how Declan is like the biggest liar of them all. And then Ronan supposedly never lies. And then Matthew is so honest that he can't lie to save his life. And I just, Found that lineup very interesting and how much lying is woven into the Lynch brothers. Declan's talking to Jordan and Jordan says something funny or he smiles and Declan like hides his smile behind his hand and I really find that really cute. I just find that really cute. I find Declan cute. <laughs> More Declan fangirling. Declan's like just casually talking about when he's married to Jordan. And the thing about the Lynch brothers is that they have no in between. They're just all in or they're all out. Like Ronan was in love with Adam and Adam knew like if he went into this relationship with Ronan it was the beginning and end all. There's no in between with Ronan. He's a, he's there for life. It's a commitment to date Ronan and Jordan understands that it's a commitment to date Declan and the way that he's casually talking about marriage just goes to show like the Lynch brothers they don't do casual. I think someone says how do I know this isn't a trap and then the response is life's a trap and I believe that's Ronan to Hennessy or Hennessy to Ronan and I just thought that line echoed so much be safe, safe as life. It's like, how do I know this isn't a trap? Life's a trap. I don't know. Those two coincided very well and I appreciated the close coinciding of those two things. The dream that he has of Matthew and the crow saying make way. Honey, I see those connections to the Raven Cycle that are discreet enough to not be copying but just like referencing and I appreciate them. My biggest question I have about this book is that when Declan and Jordan have these one-on-ones with Hennessy and Ronan and they're trying to convince them to change their mind and not do what they're doing, why didn't Jordan or Declan maybe tell Hennessy and Ronan about the sweet meals? That's what I just don't understand and I think it's the biggest plot hole in this whole thing because if they told Ronan about the sweet meals, he would feel a lot less responsibility for Matthew and you know who knows what Ronan would have done in that case but it would have stopped him and made him pause enough and given him enough to think about that he wouldn't immediately disappear afterwards and the same thing with Hennessy because it would have given Jordan her independence and Hennessy would be less worried and I feel like that was the biggest weapon that they had in their arsenal for these discussions and they failed to mention them and I was like why that's useless the next thing that happened was that Bride revealed who he was and the fact that he was Ronan's dream and I think I told you how disappointed I was with that plot twist. I just expected so much more out of the suspense that was building around Bride and I guess it's a good point, you know, Bride is Ronan's wants and Ronan's dream and it's a manifestation of what Ronan wanted so all of this destruction that Bride wants, hey Ronan actually wants it himself and you can go into that even more but I still couldn't help wishing that we had something more, something... It just makes the whole book an internal book because I thought that this book was going to be an external book. With all of the action scenes that we were getting, I thought it was building towards having an external villain and it just being about, you know, 
external, I don't know how to put this into words, but instead it turns it internal. The plot twist is really all about Roland's character developments and Roland's wants and Roland's motivations and yeah, it makes the whole series actually a character development of Ronan book. Which I guess, you know, the Raven Cycle is the same thing, but I feel like the Raven Cycle balanced internal and external very well and it had a bit of both, while this is now, with the in light of the plot twist, all internal and I kind of wanted it to be external and I didn't downrate the book for that I gave the book five stars nonetheless because although I want it to be external it doesn't make it a worse book because of the direction that it went in just not being what I wanted it to be my notes was like I didn't downrate the book because it wasn't what I wanted it to be and I also didn't downrate the book that there wasn't enough Adam and the last line of this book <laughs> it made me laugh so much the last line of this book is, it really was a nice day. And I couldn't help thinking about that gif from Mad, Ma Mad Max Fury Road. What a lovely day! So I was very interested in the ending because while I was not so happy that it was external, I thought what I thought was the most fascinating was the fact that there were so many dreams in this world. And it's a bit of an apocalyptic apocalyptic situation because there are so many dreams in this world and that's what I found the most interesting and that's the biggest part of the plot that I enjoyed the biggest plot twist and also the plot twist of all of the people hunting Declan and dreamers are dreams themselves <laughs> there's another series that I'm quite a big fan of right now which is not a book series that does the same thing where the people who are hunting others are actually big hypocrites because they are what they're hunting. Anyway, I thought that was great. I thought that was fantastic and I was a huge fan of it. Declan, Jordan and Matthew really stole the show for me. So while I do want book three and I'll be excited for book three and I'm anticipating book three, I'm not as desperate for book three as I want because of everything happening. I already know that Declan, Matthew and Jordan are fine and that her sweet meal was successful. So I'm not worried about them. Like their well-being is secured. So... I know it's supposed to be like a big cliffhanger, like what's happening with Ronan, what's going to happen with Bride, what's going to happen in the world, but I'm like, mm -hmm, I don't particularly mind what happens there, because the people I love are safe. So those were every single thought that I had while reading <laughs> Mr. Impossible. Please let me know down below, do you agree with any of my thoughts? What were some of your thoughts you had while reading the book or your end thoughts on the book? Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more, and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!